Hello, friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Before we take you to your favorite Sports History Network show, just want to tell you a little bit about some merch that you can pick up that represents your favorite SHN podcast. So far, there's t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even books from some of the authors that do podcasts right here on SHN. Who could buy something better than that than have the history right from the, the gentleman that you hear talking about it? But we also are adding things each and every day. And where's that store, may you ask? Well, it's at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Up at the top, there is the SHN. SHN merch button. Click on that. It'll take you right to the store and you can be representing your favorite podcast and show the world that, hey, on the swag that I'm using, it's the headquarters of sports yesteryear, Sports History Network, and my favorite podcaster, the Sports History Network store. Shop there today. Timothy Brown of FootballArchaeology.com joins us once again this week to educate us on another aspect of the game of football. This week, he brings us when was the term of coach first used in a game of football and who was that first coach? We have the answers from Tim coming up in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal of positive football history. And once again, it's Tuesday, and we're going to stare back into that portal of history of football and talk with our friend Tim Brown of FootballArchaeology.com. And he also has many great books on football history. Uh, Tim Brown, welcome back to the Pig Pen. Hey, uh, Darren, I appreciate it. Thank you once again. I always look forward to, to doing these each week. Yeah, I, I do too. And I've been really looking forward to discussing this one because you had one in late August, a tidbit on the first football coach. And I'm ho- hoping that uh, you'll share some of the information with our listeners from, from that great uh, tidbit. Yeah. So, so one of the things I've been doing, um, doing of late, I'm, I'm basically, I'm writing a book that covers the uh, the origins of football terminology. So when did somebody when was somebody first called an assistant coach or a defensive coordinator or or an offense coordinator or whatever? When did the word handoff come into the game? All all kinds of things like that. So just regular terminology that every fan understands. Um, So one of the words that every fan understands is football coach. (laughs) Hmm. So, you know, I'm going back and, uh, you know, most of what I'm doing is I'm searching on online news, newspaper archives because, you know, my rationale is that, when it shows up in a newspaper, that means it's kind of being introduced to the general public or it's already known to you know somebody, but it's kind of getting out of the football technical terminology world, right? Because it's going to be in, in a mass publication. So I'm using that as the, you know, the database. And so, um, you know, I went and searched and looked for any example, the earliest example I could find, find a football coach. And that ends up being the, um, uh, a guy named Alfred Holden, who um, was uh, mentioned as being the football coach at Harvard in uh, 1889. And so, um, so that in and of itself is, you know, kind of interesting. I, I mean, I, I think it's fascinating, but, <laughs> um, but, you know, just two other elements of it that I think are kind of are interesting is one is just that a football coach in 1889 was not at all like what we think of as a football coach today. So back then, I mean, now a football coach is a full-time job. He's 57 years old or whatever. Um, So this is, you know, it's an experienced supposedly adult, uh, you know, human being who you know, probably played, but one way or another has, has gone through years of apprenticeship as an assistant coach and analyst and whatever. Um, but back then, you know, the only guys who knew how to play football were guys who just stopped playing football. So, you know, recent college graduates were the ones who were most knowledgeable of football. And so, um, and one of the traditions that um, a lot of the Eastern schools developed was that the, um, the captain from the previous year would return 
and help the uh, the captain for the next year. Um, and you know, other alums would come back. That's part of the reason they used to have alumni games. But you know, the the alums would come back and scrimmage with the players. It, you know, that's one of the reasons football coaches used to wear gear in practice because they were scrimmaging with the kids, right? And so, so he came back, um, and you know, he like he would he continued coming back for you know another decade or two. Uh, Cause I, you know, I found references saying that he came back in 1899. So 10 years later, uh, a lot of 28 other guys, you know, other Harvard alums who came back to coach a week or two or two during two, you know, kind of pre preseason, but you know, guys would pop in and, and help out. So, and so the thing was that the, the, the captain ruled the roost. And so, you know, they would have, you know, schools would have a football association kind of, typically alums who raised money or maybe handled the money, but the on the field decisions, everything was ruled by the captain. And, um, you know, so even like Walter Camp, even though he's credited with coaching and a lot of other guys are credited with coaching in the 40s or in the 1880s, 90s, and, the, you know, even the first decade, um, a lot of times they, ans they answered to the captain. The camp that made the final decisions, you know, and coaches couldn't, co you know, during the games, coaches couldn't coach, right? They're, you had the coaching from the sideline rules, which is a penalty. Um, and even, even as late as 1915, the Yale captain fired the coach halfway through the season. So, you know, that's kind of, it was a different world. Um, so the, the other thing that I just, you know, to me is kind of interesting about this is just the origins of the word coach. So, so that comes from, um, you know, we still call horse-drawn carriage, certain horse-drawn carriages coaches. And, you know, that was, I'm not sure exactly where that term itself came from, but it referred to, you know, horse-drawn vehicles that carried people from one place to another. So the students at Oxford in England who like to create all kinds of slang terms they then took the term coach and applied that to a tutor who carried a student through a semester and got them to pass their tests. So coach became kind of a tutor. And then it started being applied to athletic coaches in England and then crossed the water. And so the first baseball coach in a newspaper was 1888. And then first football coach is 1889. So wow. I never realized I always thought they were, you know, two separate words, but spelled the same and pronounced the same, you know, I didn't realize that they were once the same word and it was a derivative of, of the other. Yeah. So very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think those, those kinds of, you know, where slang moves in to become just, you, you don't even think about it, you know, well, who thinks about where the word coach came from? Well, I do, but. You know. <laughs> right. Well, Hey, now you got us thinking about it. So, yeah. so thanks for that. Now, now you know, getting back to the, the way the captains are, you know, I, I know from my officiating days, captains, uh, even through my football career, the, the quarter century that, that I did it, it seemed captains sort of had less and less uh, importance in decision-making. Um, and now they almost want to encourage the referee to be within earshot of the, the offended coach when you're explaining uh, things to the captain. You know, coin tosses now are the coin toss you see out on the field, maybe not NFL games, but most college and high school games. They, those are ceremonious. They're, most of those are done in the locker room or long before the game started, whether you know that or not. It's a little official secret, but uh, that's last 20 years or so that's been going on. So the coaches are right there telling the captains what you know decision to, to make and, and everything. So it, you know, it's more focused because the coaches have their jobs on the line. You know, it's their, their livelihood is at stake, uh, whether they win or lose that game where the kid making a decision, he makes a wrong decision. Okay. He just gets yelled at by the coach and he goes on his merry way. Well, the coach might lose his job over this. I, I think where that's some of that's coming from, but it's interesting that the captains were in full control uh, back a hundred some years ago. Yeah. Well, you know, if you're, if you're old enough, um, you'll recall the days when quarterbacks called the plays, right? I mean, it, there were still pro quarter NFL quarterbacks calling the plays. Yeah. Probably into the, uh, maybe early eighties, something along those lines. Um, and now of course, you know, 
I mean, they had audible or automatics back, back then as well, but um, you know, now you kind of serve some of the same function, you know, via uh, audibles, but you know, that whole coaching from the sideline, that was a penalty coaches, you know, the, so the whole ethos was that the game is about the kids. The game is about the, the players on the field, not some stodgy old coach or last year's captain. It's, you know, you're gone, you're, you've graduated. So, you know, it was all about the focus and the decision-making and the pressure should be on the kids because then they could learn something. from them. And so, you know, that, that's, was kind of the rationale behind all of that, but, you know, well into, um, you know, well, well into the six, well, early sixties is when coaching from the sideline pretty much was eliminated, uh, you know, in, in college football, you know, and that, that's when you start seeing players shuttling in and out, you know, the pros, pros did it a little bit earlier, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's just a very different, uh, it, it was a different world, you know, before, before coaches could, uh, could coach. Now, know, there's, like, now there's now uh, there's earpieces in the quarterback's helmet and defensive yeah. captain's helmet, and they're getting direct from the press box. So yeah, yeah, and that's you know, I mean, it, and the funny thing is, I mean, there were people who were just adamant. Um, uh, Red Blake was one who just thought it was a horrible trend to allow coaches to increasingly call plays and send in what they said were messenger guards, you know, um, and you know, but obviously, you know. Uh, he lost that battle. <laughs> so. and, and I think it's a good thing he did because I think it's really improved the game and the communication. Let, let the athletes play, let the coaches do the, the thinking. Cause that's what they get paid for. And it makes it a much more interesting game. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's a, it's a far more technical game, you know? Um, but you know, there's, I, I think there's still something to be said for um, at, at lower levels to letting the kids let the kids call the play, but you know, I mean, I, I coached youth football too. And so, you know, I called the plays. <laughs> you know? So I get it, you know? Yeah. Huh. Well, some, definitely some interesting stuff. Um, now you said you have, have the, the book in, in process. Now I believe uh, you have where people can, can see bits and pieces of your book on, on your site. Uh, would you like to talk about that at all? Yeah. So I, I'm, uh, I'm releasing, you know, kind of, little bits of it here and there about once a week I, I release one of them um so part some of them i'm sending out uh that are open to everybody and then others that are for paid subscribers only but if you go to the site you'll see a, a little header up at the top that says a word on football which is the working title of the book and click on that and you know read whatever is in there um or again if you're if you're subscribing then you already are getting these things um but you know I'm, I'm still defining a couple more terms, but I'm pretty close to being done. And now I, you know, what I got to do is I've written all these things, the separate pieces. Now I got to kind of get them all to fit together and make sure I'm not repeating myself 57 times. And uh, so it'll be, uh, you know, my only goal really is to have it done, you know, at least by mid November, just so uh, what I found in the past is that, uh, if you're if you're selling books, you better be selling them in November and December because that's when they sell, baby. That that's for sure. <laughs> wow, that is great. So Tim, why don't you remind us once again uh, the where your website is and uh, any social media where people can find you? Yeah, so the website is footballarchaeology.com, and um, I go by the same name on on uh, Twitter. So those are the two places, and you know whichever way you prefer to consume. Uh, do it that way. But, you know, the one thing that's nice about subscribing is if you subscribe, you're sure to get every, every one of the posts, uh, you know, and you read them at your leisure. So, okay. And if you miss that listeners, we have it in the show notes, get you the link to uh, right to Tim and uh, you can be on your way to getting the tidbits and the words on football and that he gets released there too, if you're so interested. So Tim, uh, thank you very much once again for sharing this uh, great bit of gridiron history with us and uh, appreciate it and hope to talk to you again next week. Okay. Very good. Look forward to it, Dan. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. 
we invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. A special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. It was just another ordinary day in the offices of the Pittsburgh Guardian newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor, everything was about to change. For she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row 1 brand retro sports paraphernalia items, thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster-sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where'd you get it framed? I ordered it from the Row 1 website, where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office. But I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. <laughs> Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma, Nebraska football. College basketball art. Michael Jordan items. And so Retro it was that Marla Delft discovered the spondiferous magic of row one sports memorabilia arts and prints. You can, too, by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full row one catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act A for 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at Check out and keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan, sports writer, coming soon. Oh,